typically, when rules are introduced that govern the many different forms of motorsports, drivers can be entirely confident that they will be suitably protected from any harm. And that is a fair sentiment to hold, as a majority of the time, races go by without a problem. However, there only needs to be one major accident or fatality to open up any previously hidden cracks in the rulebook, and throughout history, there have been some significant tragedies. These are the crashes that changed motorsports forever. On the evening of the 11th of June 1955, the 23rd running of the 24 Hours of Le Mans was well underway. This year, a harsh three-way battle between Ferrari, Jaguar and Mercedes, who had each debuted a new car. We joined the race at lap 35, Mike Hawthorne in his Jaguar D-Type and Juan Manuel Fangio in his Mercedes 300 SLR were battling furiously at the front of the pack for first, pushing both cars to the limit. While it was said that the 300 SLR was easily the best car on the track, Hawthorne was still able to pull back first numerous times. Lap 35 signalled the first few pit stops for the leading cars. After being signalled down by his team on the previous lap to come in on lap 35, Hawthorne prepared to pit. After lapping Pierre Lever, also in a Mercedes, he soon approached the rear of Lance Macklin in his Austin Healey 100S, who proceeded to pull over to the right to let Hawthorne through. Hawthorne then lapped Macklin too, and then proceeded to himself pull over to the right in order to pit. However, it was said that the Jaguar braked very suddenly and very quickly, and Macklin had mere seconds to react. He also slammed on the brakes, the Austin briefly veered to the right onto the dirt and then swung back left under heavy braking, likely under zero control. This put Macklin right in the path of Lever, who was doing over 120 miles an hour by this point. Lever had no time to react at all and slammed into Macklin. The Mercedes was launched into the air like a rocket and flipped end over front for over 80 meters right into a spectator stand. Upon impact, the car would disintegrate, with many fans tragically being crushed and decapitated by the airborne components of the car. When the Mercedes finally came to a stop, the fuel tank, which had been ruptured, suddenly burst into flames, which set the bodywork alight due to its high magnesium content. Because of what was causing the fire to burn, when water was poured onto the burning wreckage, the fire only intensified, showering the disaster in a rain of white-hot embers. Both Macklin, whose car had slammed into the barriers and through the pit lane, and Fangio, who had miraculously stayed through the accident, both made it out of the crash unscathed. Fangio would later recall that mere moments before impact, Lever would signal a warning to him, which the driver believes saved his life that day. However, others were not so lucky. A reported 84 deaths and 120 injuries occurred. Lever himself would not survive, being thrown from his car and onto the track, dying instantly. Despite the carnage, the race continued, with officials citing the reason the TIFF crowds attempt to leave en masse, the surrounding road network would be clogged up, which would hinder the attempts of emergency services to reach the accident site. Either that, or the fear of sponsors suing them for large sums of money. You decide. Hawthorne's Jaguar would be the one to take victory, after all the Mercedes were quietly retired in the early hours of the following morning. This would go down to be the deadliest motorsporting accident in history, and reaction was swift. The following round of the championship at the Nürburgring was cancelled, as well as the unrelated Carrera Panamericana, which would prove to be the nail in the coffin for that racing series. Numerous drivers would permanently retire, and numerous manufacturers would withdraw from motorsports altogether, with Mercedes not returning to competition until 1987. Motorsports also saw a complete ban in numerous countries, including France, though they were lifted at points not long after, with the exception of Switzerland, whose carpet ban is only being slowly reversed in the modern day. The question is, who or what is to blame? Many point the finger at Hawthorne, whose rather harsh and sudden braking is argued to have been the catalyst for everything that followed. 
Whether that is true or not, the more widely accepted cause is placed at the door of the track itself. There had been very few minor changes to the layout since the race's inception all the way back in 1923. In those 30 plus years, cars, and especially race cars, had gotten exponentially faster, and the 1920s era track was simply not built to accommodate 1950s era race cars. What this accident goes to show is that you simply cannot ignore the concept of moving forward with the times. Doing so could lead to horrific consequences. Group B is regularly toted as one of the craziest, fastest and unregulated forms of motorsports in history. However, throughout the mid-1980s, there were very clear cracks beginning to form as to how little safety this iteration of the World Rally Championship actually had. In 1985, Ari Vatanen would plunge off the track in his Peugeot 205 T16, a Tio Bettega would tragically lose his life after wrecking his Lancia Row 37, and at the 1986 Rally Portugal, a Ford RS200 would plough into a group of spectators, injuring 31 and killing 3. However, the crumbling tower would finally fall on May 2nd, 1986. It was the 31st running of the Tour de Corsa, and Finnish driver Henry Toivonen, with his co-driver Sergio Cresto, were absolutely dominating in their Lancia Delta S4, taking stage win after stage win. Tragically, however, as the pair raced their way through the 18th stage, Corta Taverna, the Lancia would suddenly fly off a tight left-hand turn, and due to a complete lack of guardrails, the car would plunge down the mountainside, crashing into a tree against its roof. The fuel tank, which was placed under the driver's seat, would rupture on impact and explode. The wreck that was pulled up from the ravine was little more than a twisted skeleton of a roll cage and chassis. It is believed that if the two drivers did not die on impact, they would have had no time to escape, likely being burnt alive while still in their seats. The question that plagued everyone was, what caused the crash? Due to the nature of the tight, narrow Corsican roads, there were no spectators or officials in sight of the crash, only a video remains further down the mountain that fails to identify the cause. Was there debris or a spill on the road? Did the car malfunction? Or did Toivonen, who was reportedly suffering with the flu, on heavy medication to treat fever, and suffering from intermittent blackouts due to a previous injury, suddenly lose consciousness, leading to a complete loss of control? Whatever the cause may be, what was now abundantly clear was that the Group B cars, which in the S4's case had in excess of over 600 horsepower, were simply too fast to race. Prior to his death, Toivonen himself would say that it was simply impossible to keep up with the speed, and that he would at times struggle to keep the car planted on the road. Many drivers and commentators shared this sentiment, and so, with immediate effect, FISA would ban Group B from all competition. Ford and Audi would immediately withdraw from the championship, though both the championship and the rally itself was raced until the end. For the 1987 season, Group B would be replaced by the much slower, but inevitably much safer, Group A regulations. While many argue that it wasn't the cars that were the problem, or the unruly spectators and rather lacklustre safety precautions, it is clear that the governing bodies of FISA were simply too slow to react, and that those lives lost could have possibly been saved. Throughout the 1980s, NASCAR had been getting faster and faster. Throughout this period, there was zero concept of restrictor plates or harsh rule sets to govern the power and speed of the cars racing in the top level of the sport. While it did make for some exciting races, there were slowly growing concerns about safety, both for drivers and spectators. This all culminated on May 3rd, 1987, at the Alabama International Motor Speedway, also known as Talladega. The race saw two very significant events that would shape NASCAR forever. 
The first was during qualifying, where Bill Elliott, piloting the number 9 Ford Thunderbird, would win pole position, posting a record speed of 212.8 miles per hour, a qualifying record that still stands 35 years later. However, as the race began, an incredible achievement would be overshadowed by a near tragedy. Bobby Allison, just behind Elliott in second in his number 22 Buick LeSabre, had posted a qualifying speed of 211 miles per hour. The race, like most, started without a problem. Allison was averaging around 208 miles an hour. However, going into lap 22, disaster struck. Allison's car would run over some debris which burst one of his tyres. The excessive speed of his Buick flipped it backwards and then sent it airborne, its trajectory being the catch fence separating the track from the grandstands. The car would carve a 100 foot gash in the fencing as it flew along before rebounding back onto the track where other cars would struggle to avoid the now wrecked Buick. Miraculously, there were zero fatalities. There were a mere five injuries as a result of the crash. The most human damage done was a lost eye as a result of flying debris. What was clear, however, was that this crash was probably the clearest sign possible that changes had to be made. The intense speed of the car combined with the high bank nature of the track was determined as the problem. For the 1988 season, NASCAR enforced that all cars would be required to be fitted with restrictor plates on both Talladega and Daytona, said to be the two fastest tracks on the calendar. They would also develop roof flaps that would prevent cars from flipping like Allison's did, which are still in use to this day. While it is easily argued that NASCAR was simply better in these good old days where safety was much less of a concern, Looking at an accident like the 1987 Winston 500 is a pretty clear indication that sometimes, speed isn't everything. The 1994 San Marino Grand Prix would prove to be a turning point in the safety and regulations of Formula One. Like many other racing championships in the late 20th century, Formula One had been getting extremely fast, yet the events at the third race of the 1994 championship would prove to be the catalyst for big changes. The first two events came at the qualifying for the event. Brazilian driver Rubens Barrichello, racing for the Jordan team, would spin out and hit a crash barrier, though would come away from the crash with only minor injuries. During the final qualifying session, Austrian rookie driver Roland Ratzenberger, racing for Simtek, would lose his life after failing to negotiate a corner and subsequently hit the opposite concrete wall at 195 miles an hour. His loss of control largely believed to have been exacerbated by a previously damaged front wing that he did not pit for. He would later succumb to his injuries and pass away in hospital the following morning. His death would hang like a shadow over the event, particularly affecting Brazilian driver Ayrton Senna, who supposedly broke down in tears. Senna would qualify in pole position, barely ahead of Michael Schumacher, despite not setting any further laps following Ratzenberger's crash. There would then be yet another crash at the start line, when a stalled car would cause an impact from those behind, sending debris into the crowd, injuring nine people and the safety car was brought out. After the debris was cleared from the track, the safety car was withdrawn at the end of lap 5, and the race finally began. However, shortly after on lap 7, approaching Tamburello, with Schumacher hot on his tail, Senna would suddenly and unexpectedly fail to turn. His Williams would plough into the wall at over 130 miles an hour. The front right wheel would be torn from its bearings and flew into the cockpit. Despite a few signs of movement raising hopes that the driver was okay once the car had slowed to a stop, Senna would later be pronounced dead as a vital artery was ruptured, causing severe head trauma. Sadly, a rolled up Austrian flag was found in the cockpit of Senna's car. He had planned to honour Ratzenberger at the conclusion of the event. There are a number of factors that likely contributed to the crash. 
Prior to his death, Senna had commentated on the inadequate speed of the safety cars. The Opel Vectra, which had been out on track prior to lap 5, was driving so slowly that the tyres of the race cars were cooling down, and Senna's failed turn may have been due to a loss of traction due to a lower tyre temperature. Following discussion of this issue, almost immediately, the safety regulations of Formula 1 were changed. Both the fuses and front wings were made smaller to slow the cars down, the cockpits were made larger, and limits were posed on engine sizes. Changes were also seen on the tracks too, with improved crash barriers, improved pit entries, and the Tamburello corner at San Marino would be transformed into a chicane. Senna was truly beloved in the sport, and an icon for his home country of Brazil, and he's argued as one of the best drivers in history. It just goes to show that even the best of us are still at the mercy of the cars that we drive. While there are of course other fatal accidents that have taken place in a number of racing leagues and time periods, such as Dale Earnhardt and Jules Bianchi, these were for all that I perceived as particularly impactful and infamous. Just remember kids, you never know what's around the next corner. Thank you very much for watching, with a very special thanks to Ben Wright and Brum Brum Brin, who are very generously donating at the highest tier on my Patreon. Just £1 a month is an amazing help, and I also have socials, links to them are in the description below. Again, thank you for watching, and take care.